Are we good? Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here to the third quarter GIS community meeting. And uh, uh, my name is Richard Wade. I'm the uh, uh, I am the GIO for the state of Texas. I also serve as uh, deputy executive administrator at the Water Board under the new Tex Geo division. So we are trying to. It's kind of with uh, a little bit of sadness that we are retiring the Tenris name, um, though we will use it back and forth on probably many, many occasions because it's hard to get used to, especially when you've been doing it for about 25 years or so. And some of us, I think, uh, are really resistant to it, especially in the back. Um, but uh, anyway, we're real excited about that. We're going to talk a little bit more about our name change uh, in a minute. But um, first of all, I just wanted to again thank uh, Stephanie for setting up us in this beautiful auditorium here at ACC Highland Campus. Um, I wish those of you who are uh, online, if you can, I'd we'd really love for you to join us uh, in the future meetings, specifically here at ACC and also to over at TechSTOT, um, who has an equally amazing um, auditorium as well. So love to see you in person if we can. Um, and obviously, um, those of you who have to travel, we're glad that you have joined us online. So we got a, we got a really good, uh, I think, presentation that we want to give you. Again, the community meeting is for us to kind of give you updates on what's been happening at the state of Texas specifically uh, as it relates to what Tenris is doing, but also to, to gather information back from you guys on uh, what y'all are doing so we can better help and support you. Uh, we've got a, a, a great set of uh, events. We got Nate Harold who's gonna be talking to us a little bit later about um, an amazing project that has been going on for a little while, but I think y'all are gonna find very interesting. I'm not gonna mess with anything. I'm gonna just let, Nate talk about it when he comes on. Uh, after our updates then too, we're also going to do what we call a roll call. And our roll call basically is where I want you to let us know what y'all are doing. Um, it isn't just a one-way street where Tenris is just talking and telling you what we're doing. I also wanna to mention too that, um, you know, we're experimenting with kind of a new way that we do things here. Um, we're gonna implement the mic rule here. So if anybody has a question within the audience, we have microphones that will be floating around. And we want to make sure before you start talking that we give you one so people who are online can actually hear you. Uh, so just keep that in mind before you talk. Feel free to raise your hand. We'll be happy to, to run a mic over to you. Um, and then in addition to, I, I kind of wanted to give you a couple of updates that are happening with the National States Geographic Information Council. And for those of you who don't know, um, I have been elected as president-elect of that national organization. And my presidency actually will start uh, this coming September. So I've been doing a lot of learning between now and then. And one thing I think that's really kind of come to light on this is that, you know, all states do things slightly different. Um, you know, they all handle the same data, but the way they get it and the way they uh, distribute it and, and do things amongst themselves is different than what, you know, Texas may do or, or others might do. And what we're trying to do at, uh, in NISJIC is, kind of unify the way we do things. We want to create kind of a national infrastructure uh, so that all data can be cross uh, disseminated between states. Um, that, you know, that would be one thing. And the issues we've been having is the fact that there's, you know, it's, it's like trying to grab that refrigerator, right? You're, you're working around it and you just kind of walk around trying to figure out how to move it. Um, and you never move it. You might slide it around in the same location. And I think that we've been doing that for years. Uh, but I think we're, going to really try to push this thing in a different direction or in a direction that we feel is the is the right way to go. And again, I think the reason that Texas is now running this organization is because Texas is about the size of many countries. Um, and we've had to kind of solve a lot of that here. And I think they're very, very interested in learning what 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 we've done and how we've done it. We're not perfect. We still got a lot we need to do. Uh, but there is a lot we can do and a lot, a lot of information we can share. And so I'm real excited about uh, leading the organization, at least trying to trying to move that refrigerator off of square one and seeing if we can't make some some things happen. So uh, I'm going to definitely keep everybody in, uh, you know, involved and informed on what we're doing. Um, but it's it's a kind of an exciting time, I think. Uh, and from the from the federal standpoint, they're looking for direction. They're looking for ways to to work together with the states. And so that's what that's what we're gonna be doing here. So uh, I will definitely keep you uh, apprised at future meetings on what what we do there and what that's gonna look like and how that impacts us as a 
as a state. Uh, does anybody have any questions about NISJIC or anything we're doing along those lines? Okay, very, very good. Well, like I say, we have a we have a uh, great we have a great show that we want to you know provide to you, and I'm we're just going to go ahead and just kick it straight off. Uh, let's see, I got to figure out how to advance here. So here we go. Oh, yeah, that's me still. Okay, uh, so um, this is kind of what our what our outline looks like. Uh, GIS form updates that we're going to be providing here in a minute. Laura is going to give you an update. The StratMap projects that we always do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our, our new our data hub updates uh, for for you. We've we've been doing that over the last uh, several uh, versions of this, but I think we got something else that we need to show you. And of course, Nate's going to talk about um, the coast. Uh, he's going to be talking about the National High Resolution Land Cover in Texas. And then we'll open up with roll call, and then we'll wrap up with announcements, and then we're going to go over here and have some beer and pizza. So, with that, um, who is next? Laura, I believe, is on. Laura, you are on. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Sepulveda and I have an update about the Texas GIS Forum. It's very exciting. If I know how to move to the next slide. To just, is it this one? Oh, it's right here. Okay, oh, and right before that, uh, some GIS job openings. So uh, we sent out an email about this meeting and at the bottom I asked, if you have a GIS job opening you want us to publicize at the meeting, we would love to do so. Um, so if you didn't get it in for this one, uh, the next quarter meeting, which will actually be probably in 2024, <laughs> feel free to send those to us. We would be happy to share with the community. Um, and roll call is also a really good time to share any job openings if you didn't get it in this time. Um, but I'm really excited to share that Teach Me GIS is hiring a GIS instructor and curriculum designer. If you are interested in, in this opportunity, it is in Houston. Um, but they're open to full or part-time uh, work. And you can email Jennifer Harrison at teachmegis.com. Um, also, uh, they are hiring an IT geospatial technician at the city of Austin. This is a temporary position, so it is funded for one year with the option to potentially extend beyond that, and it is full-time. So if you're interested in that position, you can email your cover letter and resume to transportation.data at austintexas.gov. And as always, please follow uh, Tinris on Twitter, and that's where we share any job postings we have internally at Tinris. So the Texas GIS Forum, our update is we had a record number of submissions to present and speak at the forum this year. It was more than we've ever had before. So thank you very much. And they were all wonderful. Um, everybody has been notified if they were accepted or not accepted this year, and so you should have received information from CMP, our event management company. If you did not, please feel free to send me an email at laura.spulveda at twdb.texas.gov, and I will make sure you get that information. Um, and now, if you want to see what presentations will be at the forum, you can go to tinris.org and go to the event website, and the agenda has just been released today. So go there and check it out and see all the amazing speakers and presentations that we will have. Um, sponsorship opportunities are still available. So if your organization or an organization you know of is interested in sponsoring, um, we do have a few options left. And some of those options do include a 30 minute speaking engagement. So if you didn't get your submission in for the open call uh, and you have a presentation, that's still kind of an option if you want to sponsor the event. Um, and, okay, sorry, I'm getting really excited reading this. So in addition to the agenda and all the presentations, the workshop, the workshops are up on the website as well. So we are offering um, workshops on Monday and Tuesday, the week of the forum. Those are additional cost. They're not included in conference registration. So each workshop is going to be four hours. Um, it's $150 and I believe uh, we're offering about eight of those. And so the Monday ones will be here on ACC's campus. They will be hosted by ACC uh, professors. And then on Tuesday, they will be at the Pickle Center and they will be hosted by Esri and Teach Me GIS instructors. Um, and then lastly, 
I want to announce that registration is open for the conference. So go to the website, check out the agenda, and then register to come and attend. Register for workshops. Um, you can register for the full conference. You can register for one day. And we have government, industry, and student rates. So go check it out. Any questions? Yes, early bird registration is happening now up until, I believe, 9.15. It's on the website. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it off to Lauren. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Kirk. I'm the imagery specialist at Tenris. Thank you so much for coming today, uh, virtually and in person. I'm um, gonna give you guys a couple of project updates for stuff that I'm managing at StratMap, starting with the Texas Imagery Service. If you guys are have been coming to any of these meetings, um, you're very familiar with us talking about the Imagery Service. Um, really exciting announcement that our latest 2022-2023 statewide acquisition is now complete, and which is awesome. And that will be replacing um, our previous statewide acquisition that was flown over 2020 and 2021. Um, our newest statewide acquisition uh, will be added to the imagery service uh, Giza platform. And in fact, I think there are already a couple blocks of the newest imagery that are live on the service. Um, and that statewide Collect will be joining uh, these other two layers plus all of our other um, historic layers that are completely accessible to all participating members of the service. So this was awesome to see. This is our last uh, flight status map that we got from our partners at Sanborn, just again confirming that the whole state has now been flown and is now in post-processing. Yay. Um, if you have not heard of the Texas Imagery Service before, it is a subscription-based imagery program that provides six-inch uh, natural color uh, imagery of the entire state, um, and it's open to all Texas government entities and their um, contractors, if appropriate. Um, it is an annual subscription. This graphic just kind of shows, you know, large figures that are associated with different uh, user tier levels. Um, so if you are not a current participant and you're interested and you'd like to know more specifics about cost associated, please get with me. I can, you know, make, get a custom quote ready for you guys and, you know, break it down for you however else you'd like. Um, additionally, if you'd like to take the imagery for a spin before you commit to uh, subscribing with us, if you go to our main website, tnrs.org, there is a Texas Imagery Service project page and there is a request a free trial button on there, and that will give you a two, three week trial of the imagery to see if that meets you and your organization and project needs. So definitely get check that out. And of course, let me know at any point if you have any questions regarding the imagery service. Moving on to our land parcel and address point projects. Um, these are just some preliminary maps I'm throwing up of, on the screen of um, the expected data availability for each data set, both land parcels and address points. And actually these maps are already obsolete. I just made them like a couple days ago, but we've already had a couple of counties come through since then and filled in a couple of those little um, holes there. So, um, but this is just to kind of give you a visual expectation of what will be live on our website uh, very soon. How soon you ask? By the end of this month, yay. <laughs> Um, so we are, it's address points and land parcels are, you know, chugging along as, as expected. And um, we are very, very close to the finish line. And so we expect all of that data to be online by the end of this month or at the very latest, very like first week of August. And of course we will um, tweet about that data release. So everyone will know about it. Um, and it will, like I said, be up on the data hub and I'm gonna pause for a second for Gala. Lauren, um, I just wanted to quickly let everyone know that, so we've been doing a lot of, of shuffling around of roles at Tenris, and one of our latest roles has been fulfilled. As of this Monday, we have a new Tenris member. Uh, his name is Clayton Rainier here in the blue shirt, and he is our new geographic data officer, and he will be responsible for 
uh, Lamb Parcels, the great work that Lauren has been doing the past few years um, as she's now moved into our lead of our imagery pro statewide imagery program that left an opening. And so Clayton will be the lead of our land parcels and address points and other um, data processing uh, that will be going on at Tenris. So we're very happy to welcome him to Tenris and to the strategic mapping team. And then just very briefly, my very last update, which I will again, lead to, uh, leave to our uh, speaker today is our NOAA land cover pilot data set. Just very briefly, it's some specifications, one meter resolution of the Houston Galveston area, around 25-ish classes. Um, we expect that data soon by the end of the summer, and that will be available on, again, on our data hub, along with all of our other data sets. Uh, but stay tuned for more on that from our speaker, Nate Harold. And that concludes my updates. And so I'll hand it over to Aaron Pierce. While they're switching, does anyone have any questions for Lauren on the topics she presented? Mic roll. <laughs> when will be the end of the Texas summer? If I knew, I should be getting paid a lot more money. Well, speaking of the end of the Texas summer, is that still when the processed imagery for this most recent imagery collection cycle is expected to be delivered? Yes. Awesome. Anyone else? I'll be over here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Pierce. I'm the GIS specialist in charge of the Research and Distribution Center within Tenris, or the RDC. Um, I just have a quick brief update on our georeferencing project. Uh, we've officially had our kickoff meeting with CERDEX um, as of this week. So we're starting the project up officially. Uh, really excited to get um, all the imagery georeferenced. Uh, we're looking to have a goal of 100,000 frames georeferenced um, and that project will include um, collections unique to Tenris, so uh, a lot of text dot collections um, and some other, again, collections that are unique to Tenris. Um, that's really the update that I have. Uh, again, like I said, fairly brief, um, but if anyone has any questions, um, I'm all ears. Already a, oh, I'm not aware if this is already a thing, but is it available online? Will the, any of this imagery be available online? The imagery itself is available online right now. We do have our data warehouse um, where the public can download the data. Um, the geo-referenced imagery itself will not be available for a bit. We're still um, kind of determining the schedule of how long this project will go on. Um, but once it is georeferenced, it will be available on our website. And what's the format? The format of the imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, the imagery to will down, to to view. Either is it like download individual tiles, or is there a service? Uh, we are still determining the best ways forward with that. For the moment, we have individual images. Um, we're looking into how best to serve it on the website. Um, mosaics are something we are looking into, um, but we're still determining how we want to go forward with it. Thanks. Yes. Is, is that going to be like a manual process or is CERDEX going to be like, oh, sorry, sorry. Is, is that going to be a manual process? Like per image, you have to georeference it or is there going to be like an automated process? That's because that's a lot of images to georeference. Yeah. Um, from from what Cerdex has told us, I'm. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So from what we understand, there is some form of automation, um, but it will be using manual reference point for a majority of the imagery. So yeah. We we estimate that hopefully probably by the end of the year we should be having some collections roll in, and then as those roll in and get QC'd, we'll probably start putting them online and such, but 
I think we estimate currently right now it'll be at least a year before we get everything finalized and such. So it is a long-term project. And we did research some machine learning techniques for this particular this project in particular. And um, so far, this is the solution at the right price point that we are going with with Cervix. So, but maybe in the future, there'll be some other automated ways to help speed it up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Finding those same reference points is very difficult the farther back in time you go. So, yeah. Just comments. That's all. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? All right. I will pass it on to our next presenter. Here we go, Ellen. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all again. Um, my name is Ellen St. Romain. I am the still semi-new LIDAR elevation specialist here at the TextGeo. Um, so I have a few updates for you. The first one is on the LIDAR classification project we've been working on. Um, this, just as a reminder, contains portions of a couple different USGS collections from 2019. Um, I think it had seven classifications and we went ahead and added five additional. So the three different levels of vegetation, buildings and culverts. Um, and I was told to say that bridges were already in the data. So that is definitely in there. Um, the project is basically complete. We have it internally and we're working to get it up to our data cloud. We're just doing some internal processing. Um, so yeah, that'll be out very soon for y'all. So LIDAR acquisitions, um, this past year's LIDAR acquisitions are also coming to a close, um, which is exciting. They're in the final stages of QAQC right now. Um, as a reminder, these were portions of, or around El Paso and then portions of the Brazos, uh, Upper Clearport Brazos Huck, which is that big chunk there. Um, so filling in some of those gaps where our LIDAR has aged out of the eight year um, timeframe we, like, we like to keep it in. Um, that data is still on track to become available this fall. So keep an eye out and we'll keep you updated. Um, this upcoming winter flight season, we have two different projects going on. We have the 3 up USGS um, grant that we received that we're using to cover some of the other uh, areas that have aged out. Um, so that's exciting, that's coming up. And then we're also working on a separate project in Central Texas. So if there are any Central Texas partners that are interested in getting some updated LIDAR, go ahead and reach out to me and we will get you looped in. Finally, a quick update on the bathymetry initiatives we have. Um, as of last week, this project has kicked off. So really exciting. Uh, next steps are that the vendor is going to go ahead and mobilize their crews and vessels to the area and get going on surveying and then um, data collection. So that data is estimated to be delivered early next year. Um, and yeah, does anybody have any questions for me on any of this stuff? Don't forget to use the microphone. <laughs> nope, any questions for Ellen? No. no. Okay, well, I'm gonna hand it off to Chris then to give you his update. Hey y'all, um, Chris Repka, uh, developer here at Tinris. Um, and I just wanted to kind of introduce some updates that we've done to data.tinris.org. Um, the whys, uh, for one, improved maintainability of our code base for our development team. We had some dependency conflicts that were pretty nasty, um, trying to resolve them. And this really reduced a lot of that overhead. Um, the second thing was improved web accessibility standards compliance and ability to improve that moving forward as well. Um, with the previous UI library that we were using, it made making those accessibility changes pretty difficult. Thank you. Um, and then finally, the exciting thing is integration with our data payment portal um, for custom orders. Previously, those were paid over the phone or by email. 
uh, after you submitted your order through the hub. And now we have integrated our data.tenorous.org data hub with an online payment portal. So I'm going to give a quick presentation of some of those differences you'll see. Um, most of the UI changes are um, pretty minor in terms of functionality, but the appearance is definitely different. Um, so you can see we've moved the image over here to the left and the um, catalog cards for each collection. And that was mostly just to improve some legibility in the UI. Um, but you still got your keyword search up here, your spatial search, your draw bounding box search bar up here too. And your uh, filters have been moved actually all into a filters modal as opposed to drop downs. So if you select your downloads and then let's look at imagery, it still repopulates your catalog over here and you just scroll on through to view the collections that are available to you. So um, in the case we wanted some Austin area imagery, we load into the data set. Uh, metadata is all the same, still over here in the left panel. Um, it's just structured a little differently. Like I said, there's been some adjustments made to typography and spacing and things of that nature. But functionally, it's it's the same. Um, likewise, you can click either in the map here to populate your downloads panel, or use the select downloads panel over here uh, to populate that and uh, uh, make select your downloads and and click the links. For some reason it looks a little wonky right now. I will fix that right after this meeting. <laughs> um, but anyhow, uh, say for example, you want to download all of these areas instead of clicking them one at a time. Uh, that could be a use case for a custom order where you want to download the full data set, but the statewide portion isn't available readily. Uh, you could click full entire data set, or you could do a partial described portion. Um, and you can upload a shape file screenshot or describe it with words um, using text. So, you know, let's just for demonstration's sake do that. Add it to our cart, just, just like the old hub. Open the cart and you can see the items that are, there are the collections that are added. And then you just input your user info. So bear with me while I go through this. Any day now. Typing with one hand is hard. Um, You go on to your malformatted phone number. Go on to your delivery method. You can select whether it's delivered to you by a zip file download over email or uh, USPS or FedEx or pickup. Um, it's always been the case that if you select a hard drive option for delivery, it's going to give you a surcharge along with the shipping fees. Um, and then you select your payment method. And this is where the change comes in. It integrates now with our online payment portal so that you can make your payment over the web. You got to prove you're not a robot by clicking a checks box and sometimes uh, clicking some cards or something. Um, but then you go on to review your order and make sure all your details are entered correctly. And then you'll hit submit. And at this point, you'll get an email notification in your inbox with the email you've supplied us. Um, and it will say that you can, it will give you a link to check the status of your order. And um, on our side, our people will be preparing your order and processing it and determining the cost of the labor and the uh, hardware. So if you, you know, requested storage, 
that's going to incur an additional fee. Um, and then they will approve your order and say it's ready in our backend API. And you'll get another email at that point with a link to the uh, payment portal where you'll have to enter a one-time password. And then that's pretty much it. And it's just like Amazon, you enter your credit card information and you'll get a receipt once you've entered it and submitted your payment um, via email. So that's all I have for you today. Um, but if there's any questions or comments, um, please feel free to ask. All right. Any questions about the changes to the data hub? It's pretty exciting to see the map at the front now. It's awesome. No questions? Any online or? No? Good. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank y'all. <laughs> Okay, next we're going to move into, um, I think we're ahead of schedule maybe a little bit, which is great. Um, we're going to move into our featured uh, speaker presentation. So um, we'd like to introduce you to Nate Harold from NOAA. He's from our um, uh, Office for Coastal Management. And we started working with Nate years ago on the um, development of a new, uh, I would say not only high resolution, but very high resolution <laughs> land cover data set because in Texas we've had the 30 meter from the national land cover data set. We have the very rich veg map from T Texas Parks and Wildlife um, at 10 meter. And now we are pushing that even further to a one meter, which is, similar to you know our, our NAEP DOQQ's uh, resolution. So this is really pushing, really advancing this data set. Um, we are um, extremely excited about it. And if you are interested in learning even more and diving deeper with us from say a stakeholder input, or even you know if you just have more interest in keeping this discussion going with us in Texas, Nate is going to meet with us tomorrow morning here at ACC outside of this room in one of the um, high flex, they're called high flex classrooms. It's the see through classrooms out here at 9 a.m. So um, it, there's also an online option. So if you weren't already on that invite, just let me know, Gayla Mullins um, from Tenris, and I'll get you on that. Or you can simply just show up here at 9 a.m. And, um, and keep the discussion going. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to Nate. Thanks. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. Uh, glad to be here and talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing uh, nationally and in Texas uh, related to our coastal change analysis program. Um, I've got a lot of slides. I'm gonna try to move through them and keep to my time. Uh, if I have to gloss over a few of them, I figure at least that gives you some information to walk away from. So I'm just going to start off with a little bit of background, as probably not all of you are very familiar with maybe NOAA in general or the CCAP program specifically. Uh, that's the program that I run within NOAA. Uh, essentially, the Coastal Change Analysis Program is NOAA's authoritative source for land cover data within the U.S., we are recognized by the FGDC as what's called a national geospatial data asset. Uh, and we coordinate very closely with all of the other federal agencies that produce similar type products, uh, going as far as to be able to say that we consider ourselves the coastal expression of those national land cover database, um, land cover data sets, because we produced them originally, handed them over to the USGS, and they directly incorporated them. Right now, that relationship kind of works the other way around. We wait for NLCD products to be produced. We bat our coastal flare back into those. Uh, but for the most part, we really let them drive the boat on the 30 meter production. This is data sets that we've produced for a number of decades. Um, but a big part of the reason that I'm here talking to you today is that change and our change in emphasis from those 30 meter products of the past, which I should note, we have one last 2021 update that we're planning. Uh, the NLCD 2021 update should be coming out sometime in the next couple of weeks. We'll spend the following six to nine months incorporating that data into a newest state of CCAP product. 
And that's important because um, as I was getting to the point of saying, really where we're turning our attention is to higher resolution versions of those same type of land cover products. Um, this is not necessarily something new for us, but it has historically been very expensive to produce these products. And so it has historically been very limited where we could produce them at. And really what we've seen is that over the last several years with more uh, low cost or freely available data, uh, advances in computing power with distributed and cloud-based processing, and all of the various AI advancements that you've seen through the years, the production of these products really has become faster, cheaper, and better. And I'm gonna put a huge caveat on this because I don't think all the people who are out there selling the AI and what it can do and the wonderful tool that it is, always tell you that faster is not fast, cheaper is not cheap, and better is not perfect. It is not as easy as clicking a button. If it was, I'd be here to give you statewide land cover today. Um, but instead I'm here to pitch you on what we might be able to do to get that to happen uh, in a partnership environment. Um, along those lines, I like to tell folks that fast, cheap, and good, it's an old saying, right? Pick two, uh, Noah always picks good. We've seen a lot of examples of fast and cheap and they sound really great to begin with, but they, not, they might not be able to uh, be fit for the uses that you wanna apply that data for. Right now, and what I'm here to really kind of stress today is that we are kind of in the beginning stages of what we are seeing as a build out of a national product for the 2021 time period. And that comes back around to why that last 30 meter update is important for us, right? That's the end of our old style land cover uh, at 30 meters, it becomes kind of a historic backwards looking change and trend time series for us. The high resolution products become what we update going forward into the future. Our goal is to stand up these 2021 one meter land cover products everywhere in the coastal US uh, by the end of 2025 so that we can start operationally updating them every four to six years. If you're not familiar with land cover, here's a couple of examples, our 30 meter data compared to some of uh, what our past one meter products. This is for an area uh, in Connecticut. Um, I think you can see that those two data sets provide a lot different uh, level of detail at the local scale. And what we tend to tell people is that the high resolution data that we're going to be producing can support all of the any and any of the applications that our 30 meter products did, but they open up a wealth of additional applications at the local and site level that the 30 meter products were never designed to meet and that they never could support very well, even if they were used for those applications. And so if we take a, a couple of example looks here, this is an urban area. This is not the scale 30 meter data is intended to be used at, uh, but you can pretty much, I think, take into account here that if you were looking at um, urban planning in any way, shape, or form, those 30 meter products would not be very useful to you. Uh, whereas when you're looking at the one meter data sets, you can see all of the individual impervious product uh, surfaces. You can see all the grasses, trees, and other land cover types between them. Uh, same is true in rural environments. 30 meter data is not very good at seeing um, smaller proportioned things, linear fee things that are not very wide. And so in this instance, that 30 meter products barely picking up the road network in this area, let alone all of the houses, driveways and yards that surround that road. Same is true in wetland environments, maybe more so in wetland environments. Uh, the changes that we tend to see in wetlands do not tend to be big enough to see at a 30 meter pixel, right? You're at that scale, you're talking about 60 meters of edge erosion. By the time that occurs, it's not a surprise to anyone, right? The pans and pools that form in the marsh surfaces, those tend to be very small features. They tend to be very hard for 30 meter data to be able to see. And so what we've seen here is that this can inform a lot of additional applications and I'll end um, the, my presentation today with some examples that we'll walk through. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about some of the work that we're doing um, to build out that foundational product. And as maybe you can imagine, since I caveated uh, a lot of my beginning with uh, cheap, cheaper is not cheap, right? Uh, we were able to get some bipartisan infrastructure legislation funding. We combined that with some of our own digital coast funding. Uh, and we had a few folks like uh, Tinris who were state partners and contributed to this, this whole process as well. 
Uh, even with that, uh, the roughly $10 million that we have invested in this effort was not a get enough to get us everything that we wanted in one foul swoop. And so we're going through and building a foundation that we'll come back and I'll talk to you a little bit in a few slides here about how we'll build upon that. And we're kind of talking about these in terms of phases. And so the first phase of the data that we'll be developing and that will actually be available very soon here is focused on a subset of land cover categories, not the roughly 20 that we map at the high resolution level as part of our standard CCAP product. Focuses very specifically on impervious surfaces, woody canopy, both shrub and tree height vegetation, and water products. And we're developing those for a very large area of the lower 48, the coastal areas. Those data sets will start rolling out in a couple of weeks. Um, we're mapping the entire state of Alaska, as well as Hawaii, all the Pacific territories and the Caribbean territories, and those three areas will all be available uh, at the end of the fiscal year in September. This is what that looks like in terms of the geography that we're covering. Um, all the dark blue areas are the ones that I just mentioned and where we're developing these products. To put this in context, that's not much less in the lower 48 than what we've mapped with our 30 meter products. In the past, it used to take us five years to update those 30 meter products. Um, from start to finish, it's gonna take us about 18 months to have uh, gotten the money, made the task order awards and released all of these one meter phase, phase one products. Kind of told, a lot of folks, uh, when I've talked to them, especially within my office, that I really identified a few months ago when that movie Everything Everywhere All at Once came out. Uh, we've been very busy over the last year or two. And these are some of the companies that we're working with to produce these products. The main one, Ecopia, is the one um, that's doing a lot of this phase one work for us. And before I move on, I do want to mention two other things. Um, we're not in this to do it alone. Uh, there are a couple of areas like the Chesapeake region here that you see highlighted in gray, we're working with the Chesapeake Bay program and the Chesapeake Conservancy that do their own one meter land cover mapping. We're not reinventing that wheel. We'll coordinate with them and incorporate that into CCAP data holdings eventually. Um, and the other thing I wanna note is that I've highlighted in blue, lighter blue, all of the coastal states. We've actually included options within the current task orders that we have for any state that wanted to exercise the the remaining portion of that state and buy up those impervious canopy and water features. Uh, my hope really is that not only can we, NOAA, stand up uh, these products and build upon them like I'll talk about in a minute, um, but that we can bring others along with us. States that are interested, I'm hoping that we can get other federal agencies or maybe shame them into coming along with us and getting away from some of the 30 meter products as they see all the great stuff that folks like yourselves might start doing with it. Um, but that's really our goal. Here's a couple of examples of what some of the data looks like. Uh, this is one of my standard examples. This is in uh, Michigan, outside of Detroit. That's an example of what some of the impervious data uh, that's being produced looks like. Uh, here's an area in Galveston, a uh, sneak peek of what some of the data that we've, we've been producing there looks like. And that's what the impervious data looks like for that same, that same geography. I should note Ecopia is working from the exact same six inch imagery that you all have, uh, that 2020 and 2021 data set, uh, as well as the stereo versions of that data where they can pull the 3D elements out of that. And that helps quite a bit in terms of their building footprint and um, tree canopy work. We take those products because we produce two different versions of those data sets. Uh, one is a one meter raster product with a single category of impervious. That'll be a data set that we can distribute freely and to the public. Uh, and a second product, which you can see highlighted here where there are four categories of impervious that we'll be getting, uh, buildings, roads, railroads, and essentially every other paved surface gets called a generic pavement. Uh, this is, however, a licensed product, a product that NOAA can use internally. We can incorporate it into our decision support tools as long as the data set cannot be directly downloaded or reverse engineered. Here's some examples of what some of the canopy work that we have. I don't have any more Texas examples for, for some of these. Sorry, I didn't have the time to pull them all together. We just got a lot of that data in not too long ago. This is actually from where I'm from in South Carolina, Charleston County, highlights what some of the canopy products that we're producing looks like and the level of detail associated with those. Um, I've had the minimum mapping unit information associated with a lot of those. I didn't mention it on the, the impervious product. One key uh, element, the impervious and the canopy are both mapped independently. 
So where there are roads and buildings that are obscured or covered by tree canopy, those features should be mapped as both an impervious surface and a tree canopy. And so there's no loss of information for folks that are interested in one, the other, or both of those, those features. And finally, this is what some of the water looks like. This is also in Charleston County, right around where I live. Um, minimum mapping information associated with that. This is actually a really interesting one. Uh, provides a great example for me of how we're working with some of the other federal agencies. All of the ponds that you see highlighted here and mapped as water, these neighborhoods didn't exist at the time the National Wetlands Inventory was mapped. Uh, most of them didn't exist the last time the National Hydrography data mapped them. And so most of these ponds are not in either of those data sets. And so it provides a great example of how some of these products can help inform other federal level products uh, and help get those products up to date, uh, and hopefully saving time and cost. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're gonna build upon that foundation, right? So that's, that's really exciting all on, all on its own, right? To me anyway, that we're gonna have huge areas of all of these one meter data sets available probably the first week in August publicly on our Digital Coast website. As great as I think those products are going to be and as useful as I hope everyone will find them, it's not our end goal. We want to build upon those starter products and build out a full CCAP scheme land cover product uh, at that one meter resolution. We actually have one area where we've already released that data, a uh, five and a half county area around Tampa in Florida. Uh, that was work funded by the EPA uh, and we're working right now in Houston. Uh, we hope to have that data set developed and then released sometime, uh, maybe as early as the end of August, likely sometime in September. Uh, after that, we'll be moving on to Maine. They're another one of our state level partners who's contributed some funding. And then what we're gonna be doing is turning our attention in our next fiscal year to all the areas where we have existing high resolution data, data that's a couple of years older that were produced through different uh, methodologies that might be slightly coarser in terms of resolution. A lot of the products that we have out in the Pacific and Caribbean, for example, are two meters or 2.4 meters. Uh, and we'll be normalizing all of those older dates with this newer information and getting two dates and change out of those in the long term. Then we get back to that kind of big, hairy, audacious goal that we have of finishing all of those other coastal areas by the end of 2025. And that's going to be really dependent on what NOAA's budget looks like or what some of our partners are able to contribute. Here's the area that we're working with in Houston. Um, all of those state, uh, the state counties that you see highlighted there are the areas included as part of our phase one. Uh, the area that you see highlighted, the 11 counties around Houston and Galveston, those are the areas where we are working right now to develop that 20 category land cover product for you over the next couple of months. If you're not familiar with CCAP, uh, or maybe you're more familiar with the 30 meter products, our one meter products, this is the classification scheme that we include as part of that data set. Uh, it is very similar to the 30 meter products. Um, essentially, it maps the same, the same classes if they exist at this higher resolution and some more detailed level uh, spatial, spatial delineations, obviously. Wetlands down the right hand side there, uplands on, on the left hand side. Um, this is what some of that data looks like. This is the Tampa, Florida area that we just released a few weeks ago. Um, I think you can see at least the, the level of detail that exists within those impervious surfaces that we're mapping and some of the features around it. Uh, you know, for us, this is really key. The buildings are square, the roads are straight. You can see those features individually. You can see the driveways that connect them. In some instances, you can even see the sidewalks and the grass strips that exist between the sidewalks and the roads. And so this is kind of, to me, a, a whole new a whole new ball game compared to the, the products we've produced in the past at the 30 meter. All of that data, as I mentioned a couple of times, will be available through our, our Digital Coast uh, website. We've got bulk download. We've got a seamless uh, access viewer. We'll have services of both the phase one and land cover products as they're completed. And eventually, as we get change data at this higher resolution, we'll start incorporating those, those data into our land cover atlas, along with a lot of the other decision support tools that NOAA creates to include land cover data. So I'm going to focus a little bit on, on some example applications. Um, not sure if you guys have ideas about how this data set might be useful in your work or, or not. If you don't, maybe I can help provide you some. Um, there's a lot, 
right? Um, and the whole premise here is that better data should equal better, better decisions. Um, I've often told folks that land cover data has both the blessing and curse, that it is very widely applicable to a lot of issues, but almost never is the only data set that you are likely need to be able to address that issue. I'm gonna highlight a few examples here of some of the, the, the applications that we've run across. Um, flood and inundation modeling is a big one. Obviously, surface roughness, runoff from impervious surfaces, uh, big, big in terms of both flood risk and stormwater utility fees, but also in terms of identifying vulnerable areas, right? And so this is an example in that Tampa area where we've intersected that impervious product that we just created uh, with a four foot sea level rise layer out of our sea level rise viewer, and then flagged all the buildings, roads and pavement areas in red colors, as opposed to the gray and white colors uh, where they fall outside of those inundation extents. Um, this information has been used to apply for open space preservation credits as part of FEMA's community rating system. Uh, this uh, graphic highlights an example in South Carolina where one of our staff worked with a Pauley's Island community. Um, and I wish I had my speaker notes. I think they lowered the overall flood insurance premiums by 25% because they were able to show so much additional open space that was available for preservation compared to what they would have been able to do with the 30 meter data. Um, broadband infrastructure mapping, probably not an issue here with the parcel and addressing data that you all have, but in a place like Alaska, where they have nowhere near that same quality of data, uh, the building footprint information that we helped to produce and that their broadband office bought up um, from Ecopia was able to highlight thousands of additional serviceable locations that otherwise wouldn't have been included in the funding applications that they were making. Uh, urban heat risk and uh, the, the mitigating effects of planting trees is a big one. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, you know, urban heat is one of the leading causes of death in the US right now. Um, and tree equity has been shown to be a very hot topic around, around many metropolitan areas because the places that are hot, the places that are paved, the places that don't have trees tend to be in the lower income areas. Uh, and we were able to work both with the state of Connecticut who stood up this viewer and ran their own analysis, as well as the city of Charleston in South Carolina, who were then able to find where these hot uh, areas were where public housing existed within those areas, what portions of those public neighborhoods were not paved already and were available for trees. And they were able to target planning in those areas to help mitigate the impact from that heat. Uh, and climate change, climate change resilience and adaptation, um, not included in part of our phase one products, but wetlands are a pretty big deal for us. Uh, this is an example of two different products. One where we've worked with the National Estuarine Research Reserve to create a nationwide product that looks at marsh resilience to sea level rise. Um, and an, an example down below that where we worked with the Great Bay Reserve in New Hampshire uh, at this higher resolution level. Uh, and they were able to utilize some of the mapping that we did in the re resilience analysis that we helped them with to drive their statewide comprehensive marsh management plan. And just as a, a note, uh, the Mission Aransas near here in Texas is one that we're talking to about uh, helping them out in our next fiscal year in uh, building upon some of the high resolution products that we have and feeding that into some of the habitat mapping work that they do and could feed something similar to this kind of analysis. All right, and so I'm just gonna close in the last, the last maybe minute or two. Um, I mentioned this already, we've got a couple of different buy-up options. Um, Obviously, I, I noted the impervious, the canopy, the water, those phase one data sets that we're developing. For places where NOAA is not developing those products, we are willing to do just about anything we can to help others who are willing to, to do the same. Uh, and that includes obviously um, providing access to our contract mechanism, the contractors that do this work for us. We've negotiated pretty good cost per unit area uh, with these contractors because we were putting such volume through their door uh, and they've agreed to kind of honor those costs the partners going forward. The CCAP scheme products, right? We've got 11 counties here that we're gonna be working on in Texas in the short term and that you'll have in a couple of months. The rest of the schedule and for a lot of the rest of the country 
uh, what that schedule looks like is pretty to be determined. Um, if you're interested in making that happen sooner for a portion or, or all of a state, we could certainly talk about what it would take to make that happen. Um, I think Texas DOT and others here within the room have already talked a little bit with Ecopia about some of the work that they do to add more detailed feature type mapping in to some of the impervious products that they create. They do the buildings, the roads, the railroads that I already mentioned, but they do a lot of other things like uh, sidewalks, crosswalks, driveways, swimming pools, paved and unpaved sports fields. Um, we're working right now, the, there's a contract going through our office with the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and all the 16 major metropolitan areas in Illinois. They're mapping things like turn lanes. So really, really detailed kinds of stuff. And in, in that same kind of vein, um, and building upon the work I mentioned with Great Bay in New Hampshire a minute ago, we have done some work where we add more detail into other feature types like our wetlands categories and where we've worked with places like those National Estuarine Research Reserves to map more detailed wetland habitat features. So instead of just mapping a single category of uh, estuarine emergent wetland, we go in, we're able to map species level distinctions uh, for all of those marsh areas as well as specifically things like pans and pools that might exist there. And this is an example of one of those products. And with that, hopefully I haven't gone over time, but I'd be happy to open it up for, for questions if folks have any. Plenty of time for questions. It's me again. On the high, um, on the uh, sea rise example that you gave, is that just a 2D intersection? So the buildings that will be surrounded by water or if the first floor elevation is eight feet high over pilots means that the water will be that high. Yeah, so it's a 2D intersection. Um, you'd have to pull in an elevation surface to get at the, the 3D element, which certainly could be done. Hey there. Um, so you mentioned the imagery source for the, uh, the analysis, was that from the Texas Imagery Service, or was that from NAEP? Um, like, I, I'm just curious about the leaf on versus leaf off imagery source and like acquisition times, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it is it is the same source, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Texas imagery and the NAEP imagery are one and the same. So they were collected. Um, you know, what you guys have is essentially the commercial version of yeah. what NAEP serves out publicly. We use both of those data sets. Ecopia does their mapping directly from that six inch stereo version. We do not own that imagery. We don't have access to it, uh, but we do have the 60 centimeter NAEP version. Uh, and we do what the subsequent mapping uh, for that second phase of our product from those data sets. Um, you know, what we've seen in terms of the impervious mapping and kind of your reference to the leaf on data versus maybe using something like leaf off, uh, which, you know, obviously doesn't exist everywhere uh, and isn't always a free data source like those NAEP, NAEP image sets are. Uh, Ecopia does a pretty good job. Um, you know, if there are partially covered features, they tend to do a really good job, their AI, of inferring where those roads should connect through the trees and squaring off the buildings, even if you can't completely see them. They're there are some areas of omission error though, right? So in older neighborhoods, more rural settings, if a building, a driveway is completely covered by tree canopy and you cannot see it at all, it will not likely be mapped. One of the things that we do is we move from our phase one to our full CCAP scheme product, however, is compare what Ecopia has produced for us to ancillary information. And if we're reasonably confident that those features do in fact actually exist, we'll add them in at that stage and as we do that mapping. More? Oh, let me go to her first. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. So I'm curious about the like what you're what you're thinking of for partnerships. I'm with the city of Austin. I do most of our data purchases here, but our requirements for accuracy are much higher. Um, so we've got to have, and, and I'm not the authority, or I don't really know the details of it, right? But it's six inch. It's our impervious cover. They don't want AI to do it because we have fees and things like that associated with it. So what could a partnership like that look like with Noah? Well, I mean, there was at least half a dozen questions in there, right? Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that I'd throw out is that, um, 
there's probably at least some level of assumption that utilizing an AI isn't going to get you a product of a certain accuracy. Um, I, as you already heard at the beginning of my presentation, AIs are not perfect, right? They're not gonna be a click and walk away, but we've seen some pretty impressive outputs from the AI that Ecopi is using, especially related to impervious mapping. What we have tended to find is that um, they're about 90 plus percent accurate in terms of what they're mapping and almost all of that small amount of error are areas of omission where it's covered by tree canopy. We've compared those data sets to a lot of other data sets, including municipal level planimetric data, and they're pretty comparable. We've compared it to LIDAR derived data sets and they're pretty comparable. And you can't beat the price point on, on some of it. So I guess you know part of it would be is, I'd love to talk more about what your needs would be. Uh, and I think it would certainly be an option that we could get some products or samples of products to you that you'd be able to compare to some of your existing data sets produced through other means. Sure. Uh, so I know with that 11 county area on the coast, um, there was a number thrown out for the acquisition cost. I don't remember what it was. So the cost associated with what? I'm that, sorry. That, the pilot project area on the Texas coast? Yeah, so that that's, that's a little tricky of a question to answer. Um, so, and, and what I'm probably going to give you is a lot of detail of things that I can't tell you. Um, so, you know, we uh, essentially partnered up with Tinris to get, I think it was $270,000 to help in the development of those products. We started that conversation before NOAA initiated the effort that I just briefed you all on. And so um, I have to thank uh, the folks from Tinris for their patience. We actually asked them to wait on us to start the data development until we worked all of this out and until NOAA's funding became available so that we could leverage it. So, you know, I mentioned a couple of, you know, $10 million that NOAA invested in this. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how much of that was spent in Texas off the top of my head or in that 11 county area, but part of what NOAA spent helped contribute to those data product development. Um, and then the Tinris money was added into that and then there's actually NOAA staff that are working on that now, and that's coming out of our, our budget. So uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and give a little bit of thought on what that actually is costing, but probably the answer would be, is it probably wouldn't be very useful, even if I did, um, because I see that being a different pricing model going forward. And one of the things that we're doing as we're moving from those phase one products into phase two is some of those geographies I had listed there's three of those where we're working with three different private companies to get those folks up to speed on what it takes to move from our phase one to our full CCAP scheme product. And so later this fall, they're gonna come back and tell me exactly what it's gonna take them to do it. And we should have at least three choices depending on what kind of costs they're able to, to give me on how they would be able to scale that effort up. So I guess, um, you know, the, the cost associated with the impervious, the canopy, the water, we can tell you what that would be statewide. The cost associated with the CCAP product is really going to depend on what your area is, how complex it is, and what these companies tell us over the next couple of months. Yeah, getting that the uh, phase no, phase one number for like a, you know, per unit area would be would be really cool. So and I'm sure that's a conversation we can have. Not yeah, so the statewide area. number would be the easiest thing for me to tell you because the per unit area varies greatly and it varies based on total area and the number of buildings within that area and so uh you know an area like houston and the you know the count the 11 county area we're focused on that's probably the most expensive part of the state somewhere that's rural and doesn't have a lot of buildings that's going to be a lot cheaper any other questions Hi, you were talking about 10% um, error in area, areas where you had canopy uh, blocking uh, side of the of the ground. Have you guys looked at, uh, as part of developing or, or kind of coloring in those lines besides AI using things like a SAR or, a, you know, also known as synthetic aperture radar to help with seeing through the canopy to see to the ground? 
uh, for? Um, we make a lot more use of LIDAR, um, but that's not perfect either. Uh, the problem with a lot of the SAR data sets is the resolution that they're collected at. Most of those are 10 meter or coarser, and that doesn't tend to be very highly useful for us in mapping those impervious surfaces at you know, accurate, you know, the level of detail greater than a meter. We do find leaf off imagery where available though, and we'll supplement it with that. And there are a lot of ancillary data sets out there like state level roads, open street maps that we can pull in to help pick some of those things up. But that, you know, that adds a little bit of cost because it's a little bit more manual. I had a question about the way, um, so you offered in your presentation that the data is going to be available in a few different ways for download or through a service. Have there been any, any considerations in adding it to the ArcGIS Living Atlas? Sure. As well? Yeah. It's okay. on the list. That's great news. Yeah. So I've got just kind of two things. One, I know we all talk about AI and it's scary and all the different reasons we can go have a beer over. <laughs> um, but my my experience is AI gets you 70, 80, 90 percent of the way, and literally that other 30 percent is people fixing buildings. So just to throw it out there, none, when we talk AI, and not even one button click, they they scrub these data sets, and I'm I'm assuming that's correct. Um, and then I'll get you comment on that. But the second part would be. Do you do any independent um, quality control? Like, do you have a, another firm that actually goes back and looks through this? Because you can look through these types of data sets and they are not created equally as you alluded to. And so just curious. Yeah, um, we, we do accuracy assessments. Um, one of the things that I really like about the way that we work is that by and large, we tend to try to not be the people producing the data because that gives us a degree of separation and we're not grading ourselves and we're not biased into thinking that we did a great job. Instead, we're kind of biased almost in the other direction because we wanna make sure we're getting the best that we can for what we paid. Uh, and so we're looking for those kinds of things. Um, we've done that both in terms of us reviewing contractors work we've had in the past where we've become too busy We've paid contractors to do other contractors work, which can be a little touchy. Um, where states are interested, we often ask and invite input for some of that development. Uh, I, do, I did mention that we do an, an accuracy assessment, but you know what we've found is that at this resolution, the accuracy standards that would have been exactly what we would have done at a 30 meter scale, they don't hold up so well. Um, you know, you see some of these 10 meter, one meter AI produced products that have six to eight categories and they're getting reported at 90% accurate. And based on a stratified random point sampling, they are. But if you can open them up and zoom in and see an error instantly, that's not 90% accurate, right? So it's it's a problem with the how they're being assessed. Uh, and I don't know what the, the solution is for that right now, except that we probably put more emphasis on the process that we go through, the review cycle that we use, and having that more uh, qualitative review and feedback provided to the, the contractors that we're working with. You know, it's really hard to assess things like, are the buildings square? They should be, right? They shouldn't be blobs. Are the streets straight? And do they have straight edges? Um, and that just isn't something that we've seen in any kind of other accuracy assessment to date. Hello, I just wanted to say thank you. That was a really cool presentation. Uh, I just had more of a fun question. Uh, from 30 to one, was, was there a certain place in the United States that you were like, wow, this really changed uh, like what you thought of the area or, or just probably everywhere, but were there any ones that you thought were really cool? Oh God, that's a, that's a great question. It, it really is everywhere. I mean, you know, um, I'll be perfectly honest, I've really come to appreciate the freedom that a 30 meter mixed pixel has um, because nobody nobody can ever really quite tell you that you're wrong. Uh, but when you're looking at a one meter pixel and it's somebody's backyard, they can tell you whether you got their tree right or not. You know, and, and we've had to come up with a, a whole slew of 
uh, rules of thumb and decisions about how we handle things that we never even saw in the past and what they should be mapped as. And it, it was a lot more complicated uh, than, I, than I thought it would be. Um, you know, I think I'd say in general, um, two, two examples, just about any metro area. It's so cool to see the roads, the buildings, the trees. Um, and with the 3D aspect of some of the work that our contractors are doing, having the building footprints located at the bottom of the building and not where the lean looks like it shows them in the imagery. Uh, and then the other one I'd say is uh, the marsh areas surrounding New Orleans. Um, we compared some of that data to our 30 meter data because we have both a 2017 high res product and a 2016 30 meter product. And while they generally look pretty similar and kind of are correlated, the 30 meter product has a lot more marsh area mapped in it. And it's because the pixels are so much larger, they pick up small portions of those wetlands. And you see that reflected in the spectral return of the data. And so just by default that we're mapping at that coarser resolution, we're throwing like 20 meters of buffer around every wetland environment. And then when you add to that change through time, that's like 60 meters. And so I think a lot of the 30 meter products that we've had in the past that the USGS has, they're overestimating the amounts of some of those things that exist. And I think it's gonna be a pretty big difference when all things are said and done. So just curious, how did you arrive on one meter? I mean, you probably could have, or would it be, would it be much more useful to go higher resolution to that? And then I imagine there's a huge, you know, cost difference at the. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So um, this has been a decade in the coming for us and probably, probably uh, five years ago, which was maybe two years before we really started this current push, I, I swore to, to my powers that be that we were at least five years away from high res land cover. And then a year and a half later, I was back asking them for $3 million to try to stand up a high res land cover because things had changed. Um, but over the course of the 10 years, we have had two separate bake-off competitions with private companies. We've worked with um, at least a dozen different companies who kind of had up and coming tech that we saw or that were players on the scene in some way. Um, the first of those we uh, was probably about eight years ago and we let the contractors essentially provide what their image source, uh, propose what their image source would be, what the resolution would be, what the land cover categories would map. Um, and I would say 90% of what we learned out of that process was what didn't work. Um, but one of the things that we did really learn was that um, until you hit 10 meters, things weren't very much different from what a 30 meter product was, right? So Sentinel imagery, for instance, very similar to Landsat data. It's a vet better version of a Landsat data, but it's not that much different that your methodologies are completely changing, right? Moving down below 10, we found that um, you know, between, we felt between about 10 until you got down to like the two or three meter range that the added cost, the added effort, the added even level of detail wasn't that much better than 10 to make it worth it. And so we really kind of figured that that one to three meter range was kind of the sweet spot at the time. Um, and then what we've kind of found going forward from that recently is why would we do three meters, one meter seemed to be great. Uh, NAEP then switched to 60 centimeters. We did a little bit of thinking about whether trying to go a little bit uh, better or doing 30 centimeters, if and when that imagery was available. What We ran a couple of tests and what we found was that it didn't change the overall numbers in most county size geographies at all, really, um, but it provided a lot more pixels and a lot more shadow and a lot more challenges that we had to deal with. And so we've kind of seen that one meter resolution as being like the happiest medium for the most detail that we felt like we could get to without incurring an, an enormous extra amount of cost. Yeah, how are we doing on time? Are we? I think we're till 3.15, but I don't have okay. my phone okay. on me. <clears throat> or 3.16, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I think we can wrap it up here for now. We'll let 
<laughs> we'll let Nate sit down instead of being in the hot seat for a while. Um, I, these are really great questions. Obviously, there's a lot of interest, which is great. And so if you want to please continue the conversation, um, especially as you go home tonight and think about the applications that you can use this data for in your shops, because we really want to hear those. Tenris wants to, we want to record all of those so that we can really have a great picture for what our next steps are for this data set and um, how we can expand across the state, what our funding situation is, and how we can strategically plan for more of this high resolution land cover. All right. Thank you, Nate. Nine, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah, if you're definitely if you're interested in learning more and maybe participating, please come here tomorrow at nine and, and join us. We would we'd love to hear from you. Um, okay, well next we're going to go straight into our, our roll call session. And so for those of you who are new and even on online, you are welcome to participate in this. Um, what we really want to do is just have you take a couple of minutes, let us know what's going on in your area, so others can be aware of of what y'all are doing, and we can also be aware of what you're doing. So uh, you know, questions can be asked and, uh, you know, maybe others can help. So with that, we'll go ahead and start in the room here. Does anybody want to be the first one to maybe give us a, an update? There we go. Brent back there. Well, yeah. And, and, and please, uh, introduce yourself and your organization. Hi, Brent Porter with, uh, University of Texas, uh, TAC and, uh, CSR Magic. I'm also adjunct faculty here at ACC, so I'm double hatting today. Uh, but um, from the standpoint of UTEP, University of Texas, what we're working on is uh, we're working with uh, Tenris LiDAR data sets, uh, experimenting with possible on-demand uh, de uh, DEM workflows for generating and reclassifying custom DEM footprints and stuff for folks. Also working on Survey123 and Survey123 Connect and Field Maps applications for some natural language processing uh, ML projects in Alaska and Rio Grande Valley and for capture of an emergency response theme metadata model. And then um, we're also doing some semantic relational metadata uh, creation for work in a variety of applications to relate data sets by predefined categories to help people search, you know, what is and isn't available for a particular category if, uh, if, if, if it's required by, by some, some workflow. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate that. Okay, anybody else before I start calling on people? Yeah, uh, we'll, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll let Chris, Chris go. Chris go. Chris go. The oil of champions. <laughs> I'm just thinking about some things that, you know, would relate more to everybody else, but we're working on, a, if any of you use our statewide planning map, uh, text dot, we're working on a new version of that which we hope to have out later this summer. Um, we're also not in my group, but in Jen Lash's group, we're working on a data dictionary. Uh, that's been something that's been in the pipeline for a while. Uh, I don't have a date on that, but that would be something that, you know, anybody in the public could use if you're looking for, you know, terms, uh, definitions, whatever about text, yeah, fields, domains, uh, text dot, about text dot data. And uh, let's see, I'm just thinking off the cuff. Uh, we have a new maps and data page on text.gov. I think Travis has mentioned that before in these meetings. But um, so if you're looking for maps or data, it's a little easier to find uh, that for text.data. Um, we stood up internally, we stood up an FME server um, that could be used by like all of our business unit folks, you know, not. IT per se, they have their own. Um, and that's slowly gaining popularity. You know, you, people are using FME more and more, but that's really pretty cool for us. And we're using it in some applications um, to trigger certain events and things. And uh, and then I don't know if you want to talk about it anymore, but TechStot has stood up a, um, you know, like a drone pilot program. And Travis is one of TechStot's first uh, newly certified drone pilots. Um, so some pretty cool stuff going on there. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that program. Do you want to talk any more about it? Uh, yeah, I want to say a couple of things. Um, we're, we're still, I mean, I, I've been saying this for a while. We're still kind of early on, but 
Um, the program is growing. We're we're at 60 plus pilots now with uh, Part 107 pilots. Um, we're getting close to the end of the um, the end of the beginning of the evaluation and acquisition phase for um, a fleet of small UAS. So that would be kind of the the general workhorse vehicle that we would distribute out to our 25 districts and and you know many divisions. Um, and we're very very early on in the process of looking at uh, medium lift and and fixed swing, but. That's about all I can say about that. Um, also, last time I was in this room, we talked about uh, the NEVI program, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. Um, we are, the things are progressing. I, I, I don't wanna uh, say anything that is incorrect. So I will just say that you should totally plan on attending the forum in the fall uh, because uh, Michael Chamberlain, our supervisor will be providing a, a massive update and comprehensive review of the program and TxDOT's efforts to uh, fulfill that, that obligation from, from the federal government. And you're going to be talking about UAS in the fall. That's right. I will also be uh, presenting on, on the UAS program at TxDOT and our efforts to uh, integrate re, uh, 3D reality, reality models um, from that drone acquired data uh, into our design and, and uh, and data process. Thank you for plugging the forum. Appreciate that. Um, I also, uh, just before we move o over to Scott, um, I did want to mention that you know Miguel has worked on bridge uh, delineation from LiDAR that I, that I, looks very very promising. I know there are others doing the same sort of thing, and I I think what we'd like to do is somehow you know get back with you guys and compare the two results of bridge delineation. Uh, you know, moving forward and, and kind of make a decision because we, we kind of need to have this bridge stuff also put into the flood decision support toolbox. Um, and and I, I think Miguel's method is actually quite quite good. It's yielded some really amazing results. So we just probably need to get together offline and discuss a little bit more of that. But uh, yeah, very good. Thank you, guys. Okay, we'll go over to GLO. Hey everybody, Scott Friedman uh, with the geospatial team at the General Land Office. Um, just briefly, um, we are working with other teams uh, on future app hosting and consolidating servers. So we're, we're doing a lot of infrastructure stuff um, and uh, continuing our big projects of uh, Regen, which is uh, uh, building a new uh, permanent school fund land grid primarily first and then the rest of the state uh, based on the freely available Railroad Commission land grid with GLO attributes. Um, it'll uh, enable us to align with, with Railroad Commission and other, and other agencies, but it also reduces our dependency on proprietary data. So in-house we use, and, and you might see it on our land and lease, our public land and lease viewer, we use a proprietary data set from P2 Energy Solutions, which we have an agreement with them to use, but we can't give out. So that'll help with that. Um, and the other big, big one is the Texas Hidden History. So we're continuing to build uh, um, story maps uh, that are posted and featured on the new GLO Map Store um, for for educators and school children and and the public uh, on various aspects of uh, of Texas history. Um, and then we have our ongoing meet and stuff, uh, our maintenance and operations. Um, Main, maintaining our uh, mapping viewers, um, being prepared for storm season in the event because of that we're currently in, and in the event we're hit with a storm, um, we we support our agency storm team, um, all the energy energy leases and units, um, all the ener the the revenue producing stuff uh, goes into the lease sales, and so that our team updates all those layers, and. Um, Coastal and oil spill stuff, so critical uh, oil spill toolkit updates. Still waiting for some major set, uh, uh, data sets from a couple of outside parties, uh, the Heart Research Institute and RPI Inc. on updated um, Texas uh, biological um, and environmental sensitivity index, so shoreline characterization layers. And we'll be incorporating all those into the, into the oil spill toolkit that's used by multiple agencies around the Gulf. Great, thank you. 
I have so much to say. Um, so I'm Jackie Hincher, for those of you who don't know me, City of Austin. I'm one of the IT managers <laughs> in our centralized GIS department. And um, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about the city. Some of you may not know, to start at least, we have something like 40 city departments and offices and 25 or 30 of those have GIS presences. So if you are a student or a job seeker, don't limit yourself. I mean, you've got watershed, energy, parks, um, we're in IT, you know, all these different groups and they do all sorts of different things. Um, so that was just something I wanted to mention as well. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, we can always talk about it. Um, we also are going through multiple projects. One is trying to figure out how to modernize our infrastructure for some cloud deployment. Um, we are redesigning our address management solution, trying to leverage as much out of the box and planning to present at Tenris on that as well. So if other municipalities are listening and want to trade ideas, please also contact us. Um, and we also have three job opportunities coming up in our direct work group over the next few months. One is for an IT manager, another is for an IT application developer senior, and another is for a geospatial analyst senior. Um, so, like I said, lots of moving things. Um, and one final plug for Martin McLean, our corporate manager, <laughs> who spoke at the Esri UC last, uh, last week in the manager summit on the importance of governance. So again, municipalities, talk to her. She's got lots to say. I could tell, I could say stuff too, but she has the presentation. You have to do that over beer. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was going to see if Taylor could give us an, a quick update on Water Data Hub. Hello, uh, my name is Taylor Christian. I'm at uh, TWDB, um, though I like to pretend that I'm a Teneris colleague. Y'all are kind of stuck with me. Um, I am the data lead for the Texas Water Data Hub. For those of you that don't know, we are trying to index and catalog all water data in the state. Um, for good decision making, right? We know that that data is really hard to find. It tends to be fragmented across a bunch of different organizations. Um, we are not storing your data. We are collecting the metadata and pointing to it. So you can think of more like a card catalog. Um, a big thing we are focused on right now is getting contributors and building partnerships. So if you have any data that might be related to water, um, we have nine broad categories. So use, quality, groundwater, surface water, um, planning, financial, um, soil, climatic, right, uh, boundaries. We want all kinds of data because we know um, analysis tends to take lots of that. Um, another thing that I just kind of wanted to shout out is we spent, um, Laura, who was speaking earlier, is the design lead on this project, and we spent a very long time doing user testing and kind of refining our metadata standards. Um, I know that everyone in this room loves metadata and loves filling it out, right? It's like the highlight of your day. Um, yeah, so we know that it's a huge pain in the neck for most people. So we spent a very long time trying to condense our metadata standard to where it's as easy to fill out as possible. It's kind of human understandable, but it also meets all of those federal um, open data requirements. So. We're basically, um, we have some kind of non-traditional fields that we've included because we knew it kind of builds trust between data users and producers. So I'm always happy to share that or talk to y'all about data standards. Um, if y'all are interested in starting to collect metadata or building a data governance, I know a lot of Texas agencies are probably thinking about that right now. Um, and then the other thing that is very near and dear to my heart that we're working on is a project with the Internet of Water called GeoConnects. And so that is trying to assign persistent identifiers to hydrological features. So a well, a stream segment, a dam would have a national identifier um, and everything that has that identifier would have a catalog page. So now you can go to Barton Springs and then see every every single data set that has that identifier on it. So that's something that we're trying to build out. That'll be huge for interoperability. Um, it'll also have features, you know, if it's a stream segment, you can see all of the other data in the watershed or what's upstream, downstream. So that has huge potential. Um, so if y'all are interested in that, I would love to talk to you about those persistent identifiers. Um, so yeah, reach out. My name is Taylor Christian. Um, go to TXWaterDataHub.com. Uh, 
org, I almost said gov, because I was thinking of my email. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different ways, or you can bug anyone in Tenoros, and I'm sure they can point you to me. Also stickers, shout out to Laura for bringing those. I have the link on them. <laughs> yeah, Taylor, thank you. And, and just FYI, I have a I have a Tenoros contacts list, and you're actually in my Tenoros contacts list, not the TV, just so you know. Yeah. Uh, anybody else in here want to give an update? I don't know if we have anybody on online that's raising their hand or. Okay. Yeah. So um, first of all, let me just, anybody else in the room want to give a little update? Otherwise we will move to the online folks. And if uh, you have an update, raise your hand. Joey will, uh, will get you going. Nobody? Anybody we know that we can just call on and scare them? Claire. Right here, Claire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Start, I scared her down. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, Claire Devon with the U.S. Geological Survey, the National Geospatial Program. Um, so I just wanted to give a little give a little update on uh, an activity that's going on. So many of you might be familiar that um, with the fact that uh, we've been collaborating with a, a wide range of stakeholders to improve um, topographic data, particularly elevation data for the past eight or so years through the 3D elevation program or 3DEP. And um, that's been a pretty successful program. We've actually got over 90% coverage of the country with uh, QL2 LIDAR. And so the next step for our initiatives is, uh, this announcement just came out recently, that, um, so, well, the acquisition collaboration was called the Broad Agency Announcement for 3DEP. And so with, with that first phase of 3DEP complete, we're moving into the next phase of the we've got all these acronyms, the 3D national topography model. And so the next step of that is 3D hydrography program. And so the hydrography is going to be improved from the LIDAR data that's been collected and, and ongoing collections. So as the, the acquisition collaboration was called the broad agency announcement coming up with in this new fiscal year, it's going to be called the data collaboration announcement, so DCA. So it's the 3D NTM DCA. <laughs> oh my gosh, stop the acronyms. Um, but so uh, all that background, there's going to be a webinar on August 9th. And if you go to see if maybe, Joey, maybe you can type this into the chat. So it's um, the short URL is usgs.gov slash 3D NTM slash DCA. And that's the short URL that should take you to that DCA page. And hopefully it works. I know it kind of reroutes. In any case, people can go to that website and you can find the calendar invitation there and um, sign up for that web. Actually, you don't even have to sign up. You can just join the webinar. And I guess in that same vein, um, I'll be giving a presentation on 3D HP and, uh, and the DCA during the Texas GIS Forum. So thank you. Thank you, Claire. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Anybody else in the room or online? Nope. All right, then we're going to call that. Laura. Oh, wait, wait, we got. <laughs> Too late. Eh. Nope, hey, this is Laura Chapa from Esri. I just wanted to add that we did have an awesome week last week at the Esri UC in San Diego. I'm glad to see some faces in this room that were there. So that was a lot of fun, a lot of high energy, a lot of new technology changes to make your lives easier. Um, I did also want to add, we're super excited about the Tenorous Forum. Um, really excited for it to fall back in October again. Yeah. But I wanted to add one plug for the Gulf Coast User Conference since we're all getting ready for the fall, summer will be wrapping up soon. Um, Esri did just put out the dates for the Gulf Coast User Conference. It will be in Fort Worth on Halloween, October 31st to November 1st. So just two days. Um, I think we will have workshops maybe, but um, to save the dates up, if y'all want to submit abstracts, 
the call is not out yet, but that should be out soon. Thank you. Thank you. And the 31st is dress up day. You can kind of come at your favorite costume. Okay, superheroes. Also related to what she just said about the Texas GIS Forum, Esri is going to be bringing uh, an individual named Lauren Bennett, who is the head of their spatial analysis. And there was a lot of buzz around her at the forum, at the conference last week. And so um, please come and see her speak here in Texas. That'd be really cool. Look, there's a, there's a, awesome, yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have this a guy was dressed like an elf last week, so. Who knows? I played the fifth. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, this is not a bad elf update. My name's Nick. I work for bad elf, a GPS manufacturer, but I thought it important enough to be the squeaky wheel that the NGS, I'm not an NGS um, advocate necessarily by any means, but the NGS released the preliminary version of state plane coordinate system SPS 2022 yesterday. So there is an NGS web uh, webinar tomorrow. So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, this is why I'm saying it. This is the new coordinate system uh, associated with the NatREF system uh, that changes coordinate systems, uh, takes into dynamic configurations of plates and things like that. So again, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, this is the new coordinate system. Highly recommend everybody uh, take a look. Great, thank you very much. Okay, this will be officially the last call. All right. Oh, well, back. Oh. oh, I was just asking if you were online because I was going to have you talk. Hey, everybody. I'm Courtney Rowe. I work at Pate Dawson Engineers as a civil CAD designer, but I'm also a GISP and highly involved in our GIS and CAD user groups. I'm uh, on the board of supporting women in geography and GIS. Eurisa, Texas, and I'm also on the leadership council for our Austin CAD user group, which all three organizations are coming together and having a really fun uh, mappy hour for everyone uh, following this meeting at the Brutorium. And we're going to have our sponsor, Bad Elf, there. So I'm really hoping to hear some excellent conversations between our CAD and GIS community and how our amazing systems from Bad Elf can help us do our jobs better. So look forward Thank to seeing you. you. Thank you, Courtney. And yes, we really hope, oh, we you another question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard, unmute yourself and I think you can talk and we can hear you. All right, looks like I'm unmuted, Richard. Yep, we hear you fine. Hi, this is Richard Kelly. I'm with Motorola Solutions. Uh, I'm the director of NGCS. That's next year. From time to time, on behalf of the National Emergency Number Association, with Richard and many other leaders at the state and federal level on GIS, I got an acceptance, I think, Richard, to make a presentation, give a 911 GIS update at the forum. I would encourage if anyone is interested in what's happening in Texas and around the country, opportunities uh, to expand uh, a career in public safety with GIS, this would be a good uh, session to sit in on. Uh, you know, there's too much to go over right now. Richard knows that everything from uh, national databases to changing the paradigm for how 911 operations are transitioning from 2D to 3D. For those of you who are at the Esri user conference uh, virtually or in person last week, you got an earful of that. I sat through, I think, about eight sessions, which were phenomenal this year uh, on that alone. And if you looked at the uh, National Public Safety Conference that Nina hosted a few weeks before that, they had another 12 to 15 sessions specifically on GIS and uh, cartographic needs for public safety. That includes rendering on displays, CAD systems, overlaying weather, drones, uh, look at three-dimensional room rendering for schools and public places. Uh, we're getting into areas of GIS that I could only dream of when I started my career by doing my first internship at Tenris, Richard, back in 1995. So it's it, it's been a long haul, uh, nearly 30 years to get to this point, but we're now getting to where we need some real talent some visionary uh, people in, coming into the industry to pick up the gauntlet of building a better three-dimensional world for public safety uses across the board. And I'll try to capture some of that at the forum coming up. 
and uh, be available if there's any questions uh, at, at, as far as some of the national organizations. I sit on multiple bodies, uh, NINA, APCO, obviously NISJIC and others, and I can share uh, any content that may be helpful for folks looking at where they may want to go. Again, not trying to recruit, but I am trying to say there are a huge amount of opportunities for GIs and public safety throughout Texas. And uh, I'll leave it at that, Richard. Yeah, um, Richard, thank you so much because um, just just for the group here, uh, Richard and I have been talking. I, we've been talking for years, but I think we're making some headway on uh, some 911 stuff. And Richard's been really good about educating uh, myself and others on the team on the you know what 911 is and needs to be. Uh, and 911 uh, is going to take more of a center stage, I think, uh, over the next several years uh, at Tenrith to try to move things forward. For and sure. uh, we are working on trying to work, kind of create some sort of a paradigm shift in the in the technology. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to be overnight, but it, it's something that uh, with Richard's help, I think we can we can develop a, a good pilot and hopefully others will see the usefulness of that, want to help fund it and, and want to join it. So, uh, Richard, again, thank you uh, for you your bet. comments and look forward to seeing you uh, real soon. You bet. It'll so, be great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any others on the? Okay. Um, well, listen, I just wanted to thank everybody who came personally and endured the incredible heat that we're having to, to be here. It's beautiful here and nice and cozy. And those who joined us on the uh, uh, online, uh, we do appreciate that. Uh, I also wanted to thank Nate again for coming all this way and giving us that report. If we could give him another round of applause, we'd appreciate it. Be, be looking, be, be talking to us a little bit more and looking at our website when this stuff gets posted. Uh, we really want your comments. The other thing I do want to bring up is that um, our budget renews uh, come September 1. And if you need data, if you're looking for LIDAR data, or if, you're, if, if you've got something that you need help on, please give us a holler because we may be able to help you. We may be able to help uh, Put a little money into it, um, you know. Especially if you've got if you got a budget and you need to you need to do it, but you need a little bit more, and it's to the benefit of the state. Come talk to us. We might be able to help you, and might be able to help cost share a lot of that. So, um, you know, don't don't forget about that kind of thing. Or if you know others that are looking to do that um, before they kind of go off on their own, have them reach out to us because I think there's a lot we can do to save costs, save time. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask any other Tenris folks. Any closing remarks, Gala? Anything? Anybody else? Okay. With that, I hope you can come to the Brutorium and thank you for being here and hopefully we'll see you there. Take care, all.